All right, amen. So last week uh, I titled the sermon The End of an Era, and really chapter 8 is uh, a transitional book. And if you'll notice every week since chapter 2 that it's uh, the, the beginning of each chapter started with the same word, which is and. Right, we'll say is the last, uh, the last week, the last chapter that we're going to start with and. But we talked about last week how the children of Israel finally got the big picture. It's not the ark that saves, it's the Lord God. Right, we talked about how they admitted that. They finally said, hey, Samuel, call upon the Lord. They had real repentance, right, not for eternal life, but for getting right with God. We talked about the different types of repentance in the Bible. And the Philistines got smoked. Right, they got defeated because the children of Israel had the right uh, attitude and the right heart towards the Lord. And so today the title is going to be The Error of the Elders, because like I said in the beginning, this is a transitional period. So we're going away from the times of the judges and we're going to get into the times of the kings. And the first three verses were introduced uh, to Samuel's children now, right? He's at the end of his life and you're going to see the effects that um, basically <laughs> Eli must have taught him, you know, because if you remember, you know, his uh, Samuel's parents didn't raise Samuel, right? It was Eli. And so you're going to kind of see some of that parenting come over to Samuel's life. Now look down to verse number one. It says, and it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. And, you know, you got to kind of wonder, like, did they display some sort of, you know, I don't know, some sort of wisdom or something or was this just a nepotistic thought from Samuel to do this here because obviously these guys are wicked look at verse number two it says now the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abiah and they were judges in Beersheba uh, Beersheba if you remember Genesis chapter 21 was the place where Abraham and Abimelech the Philistine king had come to the agreement that uh, the wells of water in the land belonged to Abraham we're not going to go into detail about that just something to, to remember there Beersheba in the Bible has significance and that's the the beginning point where you learn about um, Beersheba in the Bible Genesis chapter uh, 21 look at verse 3 it says and his sons walked not in his ways but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment uh, keep your place there, obviously, but go to Deuteronomy chapter 16. And in Deuteronomy, I'll have you keep your place there because we're going to turn back to it like three other times <laughs> this evening. Now, the Bible says that his sons kind of acted like Eli's sons, right? It doesn't say that they were uh, children of Belial or anything like that, but they weren't wise. They did not belong in these positions here, right? Samuel should have removed them. And obviously, you can see that he made some of the same sins, some of the same mistakes that Eli did. Because it says that he took bribes and they perverted judgment. And so what is the lesson here right off the bat? Well, a person who is of influence, who is of authority, who leads other people, if they lower themselves to take bribes, to take gifts, it perverts judgment, it clouds, uh, it clouds wisdom, and it makes you non-effective as a leader, right? This is why we have, <laughs> or this is why in our country we have so many wicked politicians, because they're willing to take gifts. They're willing to submit to the highest bidder, right? These lobbyists, look, I get the laws of, you know, being lobbyists. You know, we're all supposed to have the opportunity to be able to lobby politicians. But the problem is, is these people will come with a lot of money from their, their, you know, these businesses and they influence these politicians to do whatever they want, you know? And when a politician, which unfortunately is most of them today, are willing to take bribes, they're willing to take this money, they're willing to take this under the table, you know, gift, it clouds their judgment. And this is why our nation, uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why our nation's in the perils that it's, uh, it is in today. But just to show you this here, Deuteronomy 16, look at verse number 18. These are some statutes uh, regarding judges. And you'll see that, you know, these things are already written down. You know, Samuel knows these things. He was raised in the temple, for crying out loud. Right? His children should not have been judges because he did not follow the statutes here. But verse 18, it says, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with what? Just judgment, right? Righteous judgment. Verse 19, then shall, it says, Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert 
the words of the righteous. We should never be a people that is willing to take a gift, take a bribe, take money in order to overlook something, right? We're called to be instant in season and out of season. And you know what? So were the judges during this time. But obviously they didn't. They took bribes. And look, you might think, well, I'll do it just this one time. I'll take a bribe. I'll take a gift. I'll take this. And you know what's going to happen to you? You will wind up perverting judgment. It is the byproduct of taking a gift. It is wrong. It's a matter of the heart. It exposes a heart condition. And that's exactly what we have here. And so the question is, are Samuel's sons eligible for their positions? And the answer is no. Look at verse number 20. It says, that which is altogether just shalt thou follow and thou or that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth or giveth thee. Turn to Psalm chapter 127. And so obviously, you know, the Bible doesn't say this, you know, it doesn't come right out and say this, but you can tell. You know, you're expected to read chapter 8 having to read chapter 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, right? We should understand the stories leading up to this. And you can see, well, Eli's sons, they turned out to be wicked. And what do we see here at the beginning of the chapter? That Samuel's sons turned out to be wicked. So obviously some of Eli's negativity and some of his mistakes transferred over to Samuel, unfortunately. Now, the things that we need to learn here is that, you know, how we react to unruly children, right, as parents, it doesn't just affect us. It affects everybody around us. And you know what else? It's going to determine what type of adults that they're going to grow up to be, right? This is why the Bible speaks in great detail about disciplining children, right? It's not there just to, you know, just for show or just so that you can just kind of overlook that and just read and be like, oh, that's, that's a good idea, right? That's a, that's a good suggestion. No, God's telling you, hey, look, If you overlook their sins and you overlook the things that they do, guess what? You could be setting yourself up uh, for failure to be like Samuel. Your children grow up and they rest judgment, meaning they wrestle judgments to, to, to be in their favor, right? Is that not what our judges do today? Is that not what our politicians and our legislators do today? Exactly what they do today. So you know what that tells me? Their parents were a lot like Eli and probably a lot like Samuel, if not worse than that. So we need to be careful when our children get out of line and they disobey and they want to be unruly. They need that discipline. They need that correction. And you know what? So do God's people, right? And that's why, you know, I I preach this all the time. You know, it's like don't get offended when something steps on your toes, right? It's the word of God. We're all messed up. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. But we need to be a people that are humble, of people that are willing to accept correction. Why? So that we don't rest judgment, so that we don't wind up like this and get removed and have our lives cut short. Because that's what happened. Eli's sons, their lives were cut short. You know what? And it's uh, just, just something that I see throughout the entire Bible. Right? These things are written for admonition. We need to make sure that we understand these things and learn about these things. And look, like we talked about this morning, God does not like it when people take advantage of the weak and the feeble. And you know what? That's what we do when we overlook what our children do when they're unruly, right? I mean, think about it. What did God tell? What was the message that God spoke to Samuel to tell Eli? You know, he said, hey, go tell Eli that he did not discipline those kids, and that's why he is in the position that he is in. And it's displeasing to the Lord. If you don't believe me, Psalm 127, look at verse number 3. It says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Right? Those children are on loan to you. You need to realize, we need to realize that our children are a gift from God. So why in the world do we turn a blind eye when they get out of line and say, You know what? I just don't want to deal with it. I just don't want to deal with the attitude. And look, I get it. It gets worry. You know, sometimes these teenagers, they get attitudes, don't they? You know, they start to transition into adulthood and start to think that they know everything and that they've got it all figured out. But you know what? The truth is, us who have had experience, who have lived our lives, you know, we know better, right? Look, when I was 16, I thought I knew everything. When I was 18, I thought I knew everything. It wasn't until I went out into the world and, you know, got married and realized, "Uh uh-oh, I really don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) I wish I would have paid a little bit more attention growing up. 
Look at verse 4. It says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Now you leave your place there and go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So 10 chapters back from where you were, Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because obviously I'm going to have to preach this um, in the coming months. But it's here in the chapter. It's very important. We need to understand that God cares deeply about the children. Remember, they are weak. They need your guidance. They need your training. They need your love. They need your affection. They need balance is what they need. This is the key to raising successful children. You know what? This is what's destroying Christianity today. Is people just turning a blind eye and say, oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's okay. You know what? Samuel, great man of God, but yet he failed in the area of parenting. Eli, great man of God, but he failed in the area of parenting. Don't think because you go to a church like this or you read the Bible, you've got stuff figured out, you're on fire for God. Don't think that that's just going to automatically transfer to your children because it just might not. You need to follow through with discipline. You need to follow through with the things that God trains us to do on how to raise our children. This is well-pleasing to the Lord. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse number 6. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou wakest Oh, I'm sorry, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. This is very important here. This, I mean, look, when I was growing up, I got saved uh, in an old IFB church. And you know what happened? I became a bus kid. I, I got on the bus. Bus came around, picked me up, went to Sunday school, and I'd go back with my friends to the evening service. And you know what my parents did? Nothing. No interest in the things of God. No interest in church. No interest in any of that. You know what? I see that a lot today, and that's why some of these old IFB churches have uh, seemingly success, right, because of their bus ministry. Now, look, praise God for the, you know, because they do go out and they do get people saved. But the problem is, is that parents today in our country, in, in, let's be honest, throughout the entire world, right, they have this idea, well, let's just send our kids to the school system. Let's just send our kids to church, right? You know, church is good for the kids. It's not really for me. It's good for the kids. But what does the Bible say here? And look, even Christians have this attitude today. It says, and thou, and thou shalt teach them. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. We need to remember this. It Look, mom, dad, it is our, it is your responsibility to teach the word of God diligently. Diligently to your children. Obviously, you know what? Samuel failed at that. You see, here's the problem that I've noticed also today in American churches. You see a young person, right, who takes interest in the things of God. They're reading the Bible. They're going so on. They're doing all these things. And then naturally what we say is, oh, you know what? You're called to preach. You're called to be a pastor. You're called to be an evangelist. You know what? Maybe that's true. Maybe that, you know, maybe God has that in your future. But you know what? That's just, that should just be automatic for every Christian, right? Don't, don't, you, don't you see what I'm saying? Right. Right, but what happens today is people say, well, you know, he, this person's on fire. You know, let's push him into the ministry. What if that's just not what they really want to do? What if they're not cut out for that? I mean, we need to think about these things, right? Did, because what that does is in that sets up this culture and this mindset that, well, people who read their Bibles and do the works, you know, and, and do all these things, you know what, that's great. Only they need to become pastors. Only they need to be doing that. So, you know, it takes away from just the average person. We need churches full of everybody who's reading, everybody who's studying, everybody who's doing the things of God. It's not just for people who want to be in ministry, right? And then obviously a lot of other, you know, types of Christian churches, they go even further with it and they say, well, oh, you have, a, you have an act for reading the Word of God and, you, you know, you're studying your Bible. Well, let's send you off to a seminary. Let's go ahead and put you in a few, <laughs> a few uh, thousand dollars worth of debt, <laughs> Send you off to a Bible college where they're going to talk you out of your faith in the Bible, where they're going to tell you, you know what, that doesn't really mean what you think it does. You don't really believe that God preserved his word, do you? Of course not. This is why we have colleges. This is why we have seminary. This is why we have scholars. This is why we have theologians is so that we can come together and give you the true meaning of God's word. And then you can take that back to the people that removes the power from the people and puts it on to the leadership, which is not the way that God designed the system. He says, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. We all need to teach the word of God diligently unto our children. It is for everyone. 
right? We're only as strong. You, who's ever heard that saying, right? You're only as strong as the weakest link. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. Seriously, a lot of truth to that. So one more time, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. God's telling the children of Israel here, hey, look, my words, my statutes, my testimonies, they need to be the center of your family. Not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays, right? Not just Sunday evenings, but all the time. Keep that fire alive. And the way you're going to do that is by saying, you know, oh, wait, I've got a mission to teach the word of God diligently to these children. And you know what? You can teach it to other children around here as well, right? You should be, we should be ready to always give an answer to everyone that asketh of us, right? You go out sowing into the community. Guess what? You say, well, I don't have any kids. Is that for me? It's absolutely for you. You need to prepare yourself now so that you can give those answers. But you know what? How many children have we helped out in this community and answered their questions for them? You know, you're giving the gospel to the mom and the little, you know, 10-year-old kids. Well, hey, I had a question. I heard this at school, right? And you've got that answer, yeah. right? You can diligently teach that to that child, and you have no idea how that could impact that person when they grow up. I mean, think about it. It's easy for the negativity to impact us later in life, right? Yeah, so we got to work 10 times harder with the good stuff, with the righteous teachings and the statutes and the commandments while we have them and teach them diligently to our children. Now turn to uh, Proverbs chapter number 29. Proverbs chapter number 29, and I'll show you the result here of what happens when we don't do this. I'm going to read for you Proverbs 13, 24, which says this, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. So what the Bible's saying there is when a parent decides, you know what, I'm going to withhold this correction because it's rude, right? And isn't that what our society does today? Don't spank you know, just loves, hugs and kisses, you know, overlook these falls, just look the other way, let them figure things out for themselves, don't push your ideologies on your children, right, let the school system raise them, yeah, yeah, we've all heard that, right, you know what the result of that is, you're going to wind up hating your children, <laughs> okay, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, withholding correction, withholding chastisement from our children, is going to cause us to literally hate them later on in life. And I can point you to people who are saved, who neglected their children, who neglected disciplining their kids, who now today are like, I cannot stand my own kids. <laughs> I cannot stand them. All, I mean, look, Eli, you, I bet in his heart he had that thought several times. And it doesn't say this, but you know what? I'll bet Samuel later on was like, man, these kids. <laughs> these meddling kids. <laughs> Right, and it says, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times, meaning early. You need to start the discipline early. Don't wait. We started, you, you, look, this is just what we did. You do whatever you want, all right? You've got the Bible. You can figure these things out. But what we decided to do, about the time that our children started to, that we could tell they could start to understand, like, Caden, don't touch that. And he'd be like, <laughs> you know, it was a little slap on the hand. Like, no, stop, you know? We started teaching them very early on. You know what? There are consequences for disobedience. And they start to figure things out a whole lot earlier than you think they do. Trust me. Now, the story I told you this morning about Kyle and Kenley, look, that was not the best decision that I made, right? But it was funny. And it made so I could preach a, a good story this morning. <laughs> so, anyways, Proverbs 29, look at verse 17. It says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Isn't this the goal? Isn't this what we want? Our kids to bring us joy, our kids to grow up and be successful and be lovers of God and to be able to teach his statutes, his commandments, and be able to preach the word of God to the community. You know, just be a responsible person. Isn't that the goal? That's what we all want. Well, the recipe is very simple. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Neglect it, you're going to wind up hating. It's a simple recipe, but it, you know it, it's easy for me to get up here and say that. And look, I get it because their tears and their screaming it hurts, doesn't it? It does. It goes down into the soul. Look, I get it. You know that's why the Bible says, "Spare not for his crying." <laughs> right? Do it. They're not going to die. God gave them plenty of cushion. <laughs> right? And yes, I believe in spanking, 100. percent now, as, as our kids have gotten older, we don't have to do that, obviously, as much because we started early. Does that mean they're perfect? No. <laughs> Nobody is. Nobody is. But you know what? They're doing pretty good. 
Right? I think our, I think we have a church full of, of good people. And look, not all of us grew up in the old IFB or grew up going going to church. And so you ought to be thankful, you know, that your children are the way that they are. And just to remember that. Now go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 8. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. He shall give delight unto thy soul. You know, there's so many verses in the Bible that talk about disciplining. I mean, think about it. Isn't this what the, what the Lord does to us? He chastens us. You know, he chastises us when we do things wrong. You know why he does that? Because he loves us. The Bible tells us, hey, you know, when you realize that the hand of God's on you, that you're getting chastening, it's a good thing. Rejoice. At least, hey, at least we have somebody who loves us, right? He's not going to make the same mistakes that Samuel. He's not going to make the same mistakes that Eli did. He's going to correct you quick and correct you hard. <laughs> so we need to make sure that we listen to that. But anyways, we're going to see the, uh, the the effect of this, right? Samuel, it, it's too late. He's done what he's done. He's appointed these people judges, and it has impacted the entire nation to the point to where now they're like, look, we're done with this system. We don't want the judges anymore. We want us a king. We want to be like the world. Think about that. How would you like to be the person who an offense comes from or comes from it's terrible jesus talked about that in matthew 16 woe unto him to whom offense or woe unto him through whom offenses come right we don't ever want to be that person that is the source of offense but unfortunately samuel's children are in that position today and they have been so vexing you know they've been so vexing to the children of israel that the elders are like look we just want to be done with this this isn't working out Right. It's just up and down, up and down since, the, you know, the early days of the judges, you know, serve God, ditch God, serve God, ditch God. They're like I we've got the solution here. Let's just be like the world. <laughs> right? You know, and Eli's children, unfortunately, they had a part in that attitude. And Samuel's children didn't help the idea at all. They didn't make it any better. Look at verse four. It says, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Talk about adding insult to injury. They're like, look, dude, you're old. Your kids suck. <laughs> we want us a king. How would you like to be told that? That would be terrible. <laughs> I mean, um, you don't have to turn that. I'm just going to read for you First John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Unfortunately, this is the state that the elders are in. This is the state that the children, that the children of Israel are in. They want to be like the world. They're looking at the, these other nations. They're like, well, they've got a king. They go out and they fight their battles. Apparently, this is the solution. And you know what's really tragic about this? We just read chapter 7 last week, and they got a victory. And they know that God helped them through this victory. <laughs> but yet they still, you know, they're just so quick. They're just so quick to ditch God. It's unbelievable. Things don't go their way one time, and they're just ready to throw the whole thing in the fire. And so they say in verse 5, And said unto behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to be, or to judge us like all the nations. So, you know, God did make provision. We're going to take a look at this. He did make provision in the law for when they make a king because obviously he's, you know, telling them, hey, I know you're not going to be able to um, basically live in this system of judges, which is an awesome system. It's better than our system today. Right. right? I mean, think about this. These people, when they own land, guess what? They owned it. They didn't pay Rothschild their property tax. Right. right? They didn't have voter fraud and all this crazy stuff that's going on. You know, they weren't electing pedophiles over their nation. Right. You know, it's all this crazy stuff that goes on. They didn't have a draft. They didn't have to give their women up. They didn't have to give their kids up. They didn't have to give an extra 10%, which you're going to see here. You know, but the problem is they wanted to be like the world. And you know what the biggest, the biggest sin that I see here is? They failed to see who the real king was. Right? We want us a human king. We want us a king like the Philistines have, like the Canaanites had, and all these other wicked nations. But it's like, wait a minute, you already have a king. And the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. And they had tons of freedom. And you know what? That's about to all get chucked out the door. All out the door here. So look at verse number six. And we'll see that, you know, Samuel starts to question his leadership here. 
right? He's kind of like, well, why do you guys want a king? Look at verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, which is the right action. That's the right thing to do. And God's going to comfort him here. and He's going to tell him, hey, it's not you. It's me. <laughs> verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Why does God tell him that? Why does God say they haven't rejected you, Samuel? They have rejected me because Samuel in his heart, I believe he's thinking, what did I do wrong? Right. Samuel's the judge at this time. He's in charge. He's calling the shots. He's the one that brought them out of their bondage, out of their superstitious view of God through, you know, you know, trusting in the ark and all of that stuff. And, you know, he's like probably questioning himself, like, what, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with the system here? We just won. We just destroyed the Philistines where things are going well. And, and, and they're looking at me. Is it because I'm old? Is it because of this? Well, obviously, part of it is because of his children. But the main thing here is because the children of Israel have rejected God. They don't want God to remember. They don't want God's way. And so God's saying, hey, OK, you know, go ahead and give them what they are asking for. Um, so verse eight, it says, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. So he's like, hey. You know, they did this to Moses. They did this to Aaron. They did this to Joshua. They're going to do this to you. They do this to everyone. This is a stiff neck, people. It is what it is. And you know what I've noticed here, too, obviously, is there's no going back. There's no going back to the judges. I mean, think about it. You know, when they get Solomon, and then that doesn't work out because, you know, he starts to multiply into himself uh, wise, and he turns his heart away from God, and then the nation splits. I mean, there's no going back to the judge's system. And this was a sweet time when they were serving God during this time. Obviously, doing that which is right in their own eyes, that part, not good. <laughs> that part, definitely not good. Look at verse 9. Now, therefore, hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17. I feel like this is a very good point in this study to set the expectation that God has for kings. This is going to help you as you read throughout the rest of the Bible. You know, we should have a good understanding. What is what is the requirement to be a king in Israel during this time here? And let's take a look at that. Deuteronomy 17, look at verse number 14. It says this, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. So obviously God's telling them in, you know, many, many years prior to this, there's going to come a time where you get weary, you want to be like the world, you reject my statutes, you reject me. He's saying, okay, that's fine, but things are going to change, and they're going to change for the worse. However, these are the requirements for a king. And if you deviate from this at all, you're wrong. You're out of control. You're out of compliance, and you need to be brought down. That person needs to step down. But look at verse number uh, 15. He says this, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. This is important here. What is the first step for a king? The Lord chooses. Right. There's no election. There's no <laughs> there's none of that stuff here. It is going to be chosen. He is going to be chosen by the Lord God. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Now, why is he having to say this? Because if it was left up to the children of Israel, they would bypass all of it. Say, well, let's just get us whoever's popular. Let's hire somebody from the Philistines. Let's hire a Canaanite. Let's hire a lady. Let's hire a foreigner. They would do that. So God has to put these things in the Bible to make sure that they comply because this is what's best for them. He's like saying, this is not ideal here. This is not what I want. I mean, God would want them to do righteous judgment and to stay in the system that he appointed them, you know, from, from the judges. But he's saying, look, when you get weary, when you decide you don't want this anymore, here's the next step. Here's, where, here's how we're going to improvise this. So he says, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. And obviously, you know, our country today is in such perils. 
most people are so jacked up, they would probably have no problem with electing some Chinese person who's just a straight commie devil. I, I mean, I heard there was somewhere on the East Coast where they elected a tranny. Does anybody know about that? Is that? Yeah, there was like a, some tranny that ran. Yeah, and they elected that person. Disgusting. He says, thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. I believe that today our country is, is, is so far gone that most people would, would gladly do that. In fact, they, you know, they have. <laughs> you know, because guess what? A commie like Joe Biden. <laughs> and I get it. He probably stole it. Like there's probably there's voter fraud. There's all kinds of fraud, right? There's all manner of unrighteousness that's going on in this country right now. Yeah. But to see the alarming number of people with Biden-Harris signs out in their yards yeah, yeah. in these subdivisions, to me, it's just, you know, it's just mind-boggling. Yeah. These people blatantly hate Christ. You know that? Yeah. Commies, look, if I could just get one thing across to people today, it's commies hate Christ. Yeah. Commies hate Christ. No, we don't. We love him. No, you don't. You love the one that you made up in your mind. All right, let me get back on track here. Verse 16, he says, But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the land that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. I've heard people take this and say, Well, this is how we know the Bible's false, because the kings in the future, they multiplied unto themselves horses. Yeah, it's because they didn't listen. Right. What is this saying here that it's wrong for a king to have multiple horses? No, it's wrong for him to go out and seek out of his own will. It is God who is supposed to multiply the king. God shall supply all your needs. That is what he's teaching here. Verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. This is funny how a lot of people go around and say, well, the Bible taught and the Bible used to teach that it was OK to have multiple wives. So what's up? Well, you take them right here. It says, neither shall he multiply to himself. I'm sorry. Yeah, neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Violation of scripture. Guess what? Solomon violated scripture. Guess what? David violated scripture. Guess what? We all do. <laughs> you know, these people that have this mentality, it's like, look, let me follow you around for a day at work. And I will find something that you don't follow that you're hypocritical about. Right. But you know what? When it comes to things of God, all bets are off. It's like, well, no, only you guys are hypocrites. Only Christians are hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. So neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart not turn away. Well, who does that sound like? Solomon. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Why? Because God does not want a covetous king in power. That's not what he wants. He wants somebody who has a heart for the people, somebody who wants to follow the statutes, somebody who's a man after God's own heart is what he wants. Somebody like David. Look at verse 18. And that shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. I love these verses here. I go to them all the time, obviously because it proves that we can have a copy of the word of God, and that's okay. It's just as powerful. They're all copies of the settled record in heaven, right? But notice that this is a requirement of the king. So when we start to see Saul come into power, we need to realize he is required by Old Testament law, he is required by God to personally write himself a copy of the law. He is required to do that. And you know what? We're kings and priests today. We are required to have a copy of the law and read it and study it. Why? So that we can have a heart for people. Why? So that we can go out into the community and do battle and fight for truth and righteousness. Look at verse 19. It says, And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law, and these statutes to do them. And, of course, there's nothing but a huge agenda today from multiple sources, multiple organizations, parachurch ministries, Bible colleges and seminaries to undermine God's word, right? God's word is to keep us humble. That's why I say, hey, read this. It's going to keep you in check and it's going to keep your heart after the people, after the right 
things. Verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Every time, every time, every single time somebody comes in here, I'm a listener at Faith Worth, right? And it's like, well, that's great. Cool, right? And then they start saying, well, I'm too good for this too good for that you know you just start to see this arrogance come off of some of these guys right and the people that go to faith word they don't a lot of them they don't have that attitude <laughs> right because pastor answer preaches you need to read the bible yeah. you know what i mean but or they'll leave comments like i agree with pastor anderson on this it's like yeah. did you listen to what i said <laughs> did you ha did you listen no you didn't you didn't listen you're proud you're arrogant. You listen to sermons, which is great, but you don't read the Bible. And the byproduct of not reading the Bible is arrogance. It's pride. It's, you know, it's what happens when people gain too much knowledge too quickly. They don't get a chance to turn that into wisdom. And guess what? All bets are off. Game over. Now you're filled with pride. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So it's not just only for the king, but for his entire family. Because the idea here is you select a king. Okay, he's got to meet all of these requirements. He has to do these things. But he needs to teach these things to his children so that we can have more options to select kings in the future. Obviously, you know how that went, right? Word of God, right out the window. Good king, bad king, good king, bad king. And it's just a reflect. It's the same pattern that the, judge, the book of Judges follows. You know, good judge, bad judge, good judge, bad judge. This is terrible. So go back to uh, 1 Samuel. We'll, we'll continue on here. We're getting close to being done. And so we're gonna, now the chapter is going to start telling us about the coming changes, right? The taxes, the additional 10% that now the children of Israel are going to have to give the king. Right, the loss of uh, food and all these different things. So verse number 10, it says, And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. This is new. This hasn't happened yet before. And Samuel's trying to warn these people, Hey, look, guess what? These are the changes coming down the pipe, all because you want to be like the world. Verse 12, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariot. So he's saying, hey, look, guess what? He's going to take your kids to fund his military and to basically work for his economy. Verse 13, and he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. That's exactly what the government does today. <laughs> but ten times worse than this, right? They'll take all kinds of stuff. Look, the best, the best food, the best benefits, the best time, the best autonomy that I've ever had has been working for the government. You know, and they'd always be like, I, I can remember your people, you know, on a 12 hour shift, you know, two hours in, the boss like, you know, we're going to go home and get paid for 12 today. People got their feet kicked up, you know, just just totally relaxed, playing all sorts of games on their phone or whatever. And just like, I'm just thinking like, you know, they'd be like, hey, thanks to the taxpayers, man, you know, doing this type of stuff. It's true. It happens all the time. <laughs> uh, verse 14, or I'm sorry, verse 15, and he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. Now think about this. This is an additional 10% aside from what was due to the Levites. Now they've got to cough up 20% of their paycheck, right? It's just getting worse. See, the more that you want to be like the world, the more percentage of your income of everything you're going to wind up giving to the enemy, you know, to it's just the way that, the, that this thing works. Verse 16, and he will take of your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. Verse 17, he will take a tenth of your sheep and you shall be served. Just more, right? That's what he's going to do. Samuel's telling them this. I, this king is going to take all your stuff. Well, not all of it, but you, you get the idea here. It's not going to be comfortable like you have it now. He's basically saying, you know what? You're going to regret this old system. Verse 18, you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. And so guess what happens? The Lord grants their request. 
You know, despite Samuel's warning, I mean, these people are so marred in their thinking. Despite hearing this, all they hear is just, just give us a king. We want to be like the world. Just give us a king. Just give us a king. We just want to be like the world. We don't care. We're tired of these judges. So look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us. Isn't that just how people are today? <laughs> you just warn people left and right, show them concrete proof. Hey, this is what's going to happen. You know, you, you tell people about communism, and they're just like, I just want to be like Mao. I just want to be like China. You know, it's like, how many Hollywood celebrities are over in China? How many professional basketball players and NFL players? You notice how that stuff's kind of missing from these communist countries? Yeah. <laughs> you tell these people that, and they're just like, no, we want to be like them. They're so tolerant and, ju and just loving. It's just great. It's better. You just don't know. No, you don't know. <laughs> just like they didn't know. Just ignore it. Look at verse 20. It says, that we also may be like the nations. I'm sorry, that we may also that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. All right, they're getting weary, they're getting tired, they they've just zero strength. Verse 21. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. And so at the end of the chapter, they really just do a good job at showing the rejection for God. Right? God makes a statement to Samuel, Hey, it's not you, it's me. They have rejected me, and they just completely show it. I mean, Samuel, who's been judging them forever, it seemed like, you know, for a very long time, he's warning them, and it's like, Has Samuel ever failed you before? No. Has it have his kids? Of course. But, you know, they just, they're just they willing to just brush that all aside, all because they, they, their minds and their hearts are just set on being like the nations around them. And, you know, so you say, well, what's the, what's the message there? That's pretty obvious. You desire to be like the world, God's going to be like, have at it. Now comes the hand. Now you're going to have to deal with giving up your rewards. And all, just all these things. It's just nothing but bondage at the end of the day. That's what it is. And so we're going to stop there. Next week we'll talk about the quest of finding King Saul, and uh, it's going to be great. And so we'll bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, uh, for these chapters in the Bible, and thank you so much, Lord, for the messages, uh, even though they were uh, they took place so long ago, Lord, but yet still so applicable in our own lives today. Just pray you bless the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.